Item on the order papers, a motion on honouring the EU withdrawal agreement protocol. I'll ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly acknowledges that the majority of citizens voted to reject Brexit, recognises that the departure from the EU gives rise to substantial political and economic challenges for our society, further recognises that while the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland is imperfect, it guarantees that whatever the circumstances, there will be no hard border on the island and will protect the Good Friday Agreement in all its dimensions. North-South cooperation and the all-island economy believes it would be entirely unacceptable if the British government sought to abandon these safeguards and mitigations, as this would amount to a serious betrayal of an existing international treaty, and calls on the British government to honour its commitments and to ensure now the rigorous and full implementation of the Protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland prioritise peace and stability and work to secure a future economic partnership with their EU colleagues now and in the weeks ahead. I now call Martina Anderson to formally move the motion. So moved. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and a further 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. And I invite you to open the motion. Well, may I get the last can call you. Um, Ariam Hun and Ruan Shaw Awogi, I rise to move this motion. There is no doubt that Brexit is an unmitigated disaster. How the British government treated the Brexit withdrawal agreement and the protocol is no different to any other agreement that they have ever made. Sinn Féin warned the EU not to trust the British government and, true to form, after agreeing the withdrawal agreement and the protocol, the British government immediately reinterpreted it, misinterpreted it, transcribed it in incorrectly into domestic law and simply denied it. EU laws, policies and funding touch on almost every aspect of our daily lives. There are, in fact, 115 areas of EU laws that engages the executive and this Assembly's competency. And as this motion states, it is unacceptable that the British government would seek to abandon the safeguards and the mitigations that were in the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. Brexiteers like Geoffrey Cox have described what Britain has done with its internal market bill as unconscionable. The Lord Chief Justice Declan Morgan stated that the Britain's plan, Brexit plan bill undermines the rule of law domestically. Scotland's most senior law officer resigned over Britain's Brexit internal market bill. Angela Merkel says that Britain has joined the ranks of despots. Now, all of that speaks volumes. Even hardened Brexiteers must know that Brexit gives rise to political and economic challenges and that it is damaging, reckless and wrong. The Good Friday Agreement is facing an attack on all fronts. The British government has eroded the authority of this Assembly, for example by overriding our budgetary role and can do so without as much as a nod to the Finance Minister, Conor Murphy, or the wider executive. The British government has also sidelined north-south cooperation. Environmental, environment, environment, for instance, is a Good Friday Agreement area of cooperation, but Brexiteers rejected the need for a level playing field, which would ensure EU environmental protections were aligned across the island. Environmental standards in Derry would have remained the same as those in Bonkrana, and anyone with a titter of wit would know and understand that pollution does not know any border. The Good Friday Agreement states that the British and Irish government must, and I quote, discuss, consult and use best endeavours to reach agreement on cooperation on matters of mutual interest, which include EU matters. Yet no such consultation or discussion took place between the British and Irish government because the British government completely ignored the role of the Irish government as a co-guarantor. The British government is driving a horse and cart through strands one, two and three 
of the Good Friday Agreement. And as Sinn Féin said in 2016, relating to the Good Friday Agreement and many others have repeated it, Britannia waived the rules. The protocol in the withdrawal agreement was not perfect. It was an ugly compromise, but it mitigated the worst impact of Brexit. It prevented a harder border on the island of Ireland, it protected the all-Ireland economy and upheld the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts. Now, we have heard lots of comments about where our biggest market is. The fact is that the North's economy is dominated by SMEs, 80% of which trade across Ireland. Here are examples of the breathtakingly scale of the damage done to lives and livelihoods by this Brexit mess. One quarter of the milk produced in the North is processed in the South. Chickens in their thousands produced in the South are processed in the North. 10,000 pigs come to the North from the South every week. The production of Guinness necessitates approximately 13,000 crossings in Ireland every year. Every day, almost 7,000 good vehicles travel the A1 dual carriageway between Belfast and Dublin. Coca-Cola employs 522 people in Lisburn, and its produce are sold throughout Ireland and any delays as a result of Brexit on the island of Ireland will cost €100 Euros for every lorry, and there are many of them that cross the border every day. Bombardier, one of the North's largest employers, engaged more than 60 suppliers in the south of Ireland. Food, beverages, etc., account for 49% of the all-Ireland manufacturing trade and 10% of the North's GDP comes from the EU. 3.5 million of European funding gone. Sinn Féin's position on east-west trade is clear, very clear. It must be as frictionless as possible. But let's nail the nonsense about not tolerating the border in the Irish Sea. Have you not been asleep for many decades there has been a border in the Irish Sea. Animals and animal produce, food, um, fertiliser, a lot of things have been checked at the border for many, many years. So this new found offence does not wash with thinking people. While Brexit will intensify those checks, unfortunately they, it will. But we warned, we tried to warn Brexiteers that there was no and there would never be any good Brexit and that, that there would be consequences. There has been a lot of focus on trade, goods and on farmers in the North, rightly so, losing over two billion of European funding payments. Whilst many groups losing EU social funds look on in despair and increasing alarm. However, let's not forget another big erosion caused by Brexit. Your hard-won rights. Sometimes we don't know what we have until they're gone. Last week, the Human Rights and Equality Commissions addressed the TEO Committee. Both commissions live in hope that the British government will honour the Withdrawal Agreement Protocol Article 2, which states that there will be no diminution of our rights. But hopes and wishes are for Christmas. British duplicity, on the other hand, is unfortunately real and worrying. British ministers already expressed an interest in lighting a bonfire under hard-won rights. In fact, they have already started that fire when Brexit enabled them to bin the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which prevents discrimination, including disability discrimination, recognising the rights of people with disabilities to benefit from measures designed to ensure their independence and integration. Given that the North has the lowest level of human rights protections, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights was important for us here. The DUP won't even agree to a single equality bill. They won't agree to a bill of rights. So don't believe them when they tell us that those rights will be sorted. Maternity leave, workers' rights, consumer rights, equality pay, and so much more are under threat. And the British government has already declared its intention to commence a full frontal attack 
on rights when it scraps the European Convention on Human Rights. This Sinn Féin motion calls for the full implementation of the Irish Protocol as agreed. This is in the best interest of all citizens across the island, and I urge parties to recognise that. Sinn Féin also calls on the Dublin government, the EU and the international community to again stand firm in defence of the Irish peace process and in opposition to the increasingly reckless actions of the British government led by Boris Johnson. The EU Council told us all that there is a democratic way back into the EU and that, if through a democratic process, the country is reunited, then the whole of Ireland is in the EU. Those having that sensible, rational and legitimate conversation about constitutional change and how best to share this island in the future are the reasonable people in the room. And we are the people who will work to defend the Good Friday Agreement, the All-Ireland Economy and the peace Order. process from Britain's reckless Brexit agenda. There's not an MP in Westminster stopping Boris or Brexit. But you, the people, through a democratic process, you can stop him and his cabinet imposing all of this madness Member on all March of us. Over minimum August. Thank you. I call Paul Given. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, of course, the motion by Sinn Féin introduced by the member uh, who has that reputation of, of course, speaking with such grace and poise, who told the British Prime Minister in the European Parliament to stick it where the sun doesn't shine. And then we're the ones that are unreasonable because of the position that we take. I have to say to Sinn Féin, if you're going to introduce controversial motions like this, have them proposed by somebody that we may take a little bit more serious than the member for FOIL. But this motion reveals what it's all about for Sinn Féin. It is all about the North-South. It's all about the all-island agenda that the member then spoke of right at the end about the reunification of this island. Nowhere in the motion does it mention East-West. It doesn't exist in the motion that Sinn Féin have brought. It talks about uh, the uh, North-South cooperation. It talks about the all-island economy. Then, of course, it repeats the debate about Brexit and the citizens, undefined of where, that rejected Bre uh, Brexit. Let's not repeat it was a, a United Kingdom-wide referendum. Let's not go over the grounds that there were constituencies, including my own, that voted to leave the European Union. The people of Northern Ireland don't want to go over that debate. We're now dealing with the outworkings of, of it, whether you agreed or not. But the motion talks about the protocol being imperfect. Well, now, there's an understatement. But, of course, it's imperfect. Ignore the consequences because it delivers the objective that Sinn Féin, the SDLP and the Alliance Party who have supported the protocol want to achieve. And I think that that's something that whenever we hear from the Alliance will be very interested because the Alliance have joined with Sinn Féin and the SDLP at every opportunity when it has come to the European Union and it has come to Brexit. They have always went against the unionist people's position when it comes to this particular issue. Before the internal market was even published, Mem members, members in this I'll not give way. Members in this house were jumping up and down matters of the day before it was even published, and they knew what was in it. Such is the interest that they have when it comes to the detail of how we work out this protocol and minimise its impact. Whenever you look at the protocol, the barriers that it creates to trade, it undermines our ability to have the unfettered trade, which has been often talked about, not just by the United Kingdom, but indeed by the European Union. But when you see that in reality, there isn't unfettered access, because the protocol is an instrument to punish the people here in Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom. It is an instrument being exploited by the European Union and our predatory neighbour in the Irish Republic when it comes to commercial activities that are going to flow as the outworking of it. And the members dismiss it, those in the SDLP, Sinn Féin and Alliance. No surprise that the Alliance dismiss it again, given that the position that they have held. But the implications upon trade should not be diminished by anybody in this House. Trade, I will. Thank the member for giving way. Would the member agree with me that it's a real ludicrous position that some MPs, including the MP for Foyle Column Eastwood, to be actively campaigning against trade deals with the US, given the significant economic challenges that exist within our constituency? Members, the next minute. And, and, and herein 
I think the public will see that not only do we need to agree to the party's opposite position when it comes to this, but if you dare go against it, we'll lobby in the United States and we'll seek to punish the people by not having a trade agreement. Isn't it absurd that if you don't get your politically ideological driven position, you will then penalise the people of Northern Ireland, you'll seek to damage our economy, you'll lobby in the States to try and uh, prevent a trade deal from taking place, and you then go on to say this threatens peace and stability. And the member for Foyle and Westminster went on to talk about this, about violence. So not only will you use political arguments, not only do you want to use economic uh, leverage, you then follow it up with threats. You then follow it up with threats of violence to achieve what you want to achieve, because that is implicit when you talk about peace and stability, and that if we don't do what you want, who's, where's the threat coming of peace and stability? Where's the violence going to come from? So you use it implicitly to imply, do as we say, because somewhere out there there could be a problem that then could inflict something that damages our peace and stability. So whenever I look at this motion, there is no other position that any unionist certainly could take but to reject it. And indeed, this is the position that should be taken for those that actually care about the people of Northern Ireland, because 65 per cent of purchases come from Great Britain, 13.3 billion, and you want to put up trade barriers, customs declarations, regulatory burdens, increased costs. Our consumers then pay the price. 53 per cent of external sales from Northern Ireland go into Great Britain, 2.3 billion. And the member for Foyle that introduced the motion talked about 80 per cent of SMEs trading on an all-island basis. 90 per cent of SMEs trade with Great Britain but no concern for what implications there could be for the costs of their business. This is a motion which is politically driven, ideologically driven, to advance the only issue that Sinn Féin care about when it comes to Brexit, and that's the reunification of Ireland, and everyone should reject it. But the alliance will still the go with Sinn Féin close. and their bedfellows for the SDLP. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'll try and lower the temperature after uh, some... Uh, tub thumping there. It's difficult to take seriously the suggestions from anyone in the DUP that they care about fettering of trade or they care about trade barriers when this entire process has been driven by Brexit, which is at its core and at first principles about increasing trade barriers uh, on the continent of Europe between the United Kingdom and the EU. So it's very, very difficult to be lectured by people like Mr Given, who were triumphant enthusiasts for Brexit, which is the biggest increase in trade barriers probably since uh, in the modern era, certainly since the Second World War. Really a, remarkable, uh, a remarkably ironic statement. Alanis Morissette couldn't have written Mr Given's speech uh, any better, given the level of irony in it. Uh, I rise today to support uh, the motion, uh, and my party supports the motion. I agree with the sentiment in the motion, which is that no one should be in any doubt that the protocol is a, um, is a perfect document. Let's be absolutely clear. Five years ago, I, my party, uh, others in this chamber, I'm sure, would not have selected the protocol as a framework for uh, Northern Ireland, this island, or uh, commerce across these islands. We wouldn't. But we're presented with a position where the success of the United Kingdom governments reaching its zenith under Boris Johnson and the ideologues around him have decided that they want to break from the European Union in the sharpest, most dramatic way possible. That presents people in Northern Ireland with a dilemma. And that was the same dilemma that was, that was there in 2016. I used to be a civil servant. I sometimes talk about this in the chamber. I worked in Number 10 Downing Street before the referendum in 2016. I worked in there subsequently and since left. Part of the reason, a large part of the reason, is deep and abiding frustration with the recklessness in relation to Northern Ireland, uh, our post-conflict society, but also our economy and also um, our people. It's been deeply, deeply frustrating, and unfortunately, it has only gotten worse. Is this protocol perfect? No, absolutely it isn't. Let's first be really clear about what the protocol is. The protocol is a limited set of protections against the creation of a hard border, largely in goods on the island of Ireland, so Northern Ireland will remain in the single market for goods and uh, subject to the European Union Customs Code and effectively in the EU uh, Customs Union. But 
It doesn't mean there won't be a hardening of the border in a whole range of other areas. There are certain members opposite who probably quite gleefully like the idea of divergence uh, between the two jurisdictions in this island. Well, they'll get it, unfortunately, in many areas, because there is going to be divergence in relation to the services economy. It will be more difficult for people involved in services to do business across the border on the island of Ireland. So, if, if that's what you sought from Brexit, well done, because you're going to get it. That's what you're going to get it. We're going to have divergent regimes in terms of immigration. That's going to throw up all sorts of challenges. There are innumerable other areas when there will be, where there will be a hardened border on the island of Ireland. But in, specifically in relation to goods, we, we do have protection from the hardening of a border in goods and certain other protections as a result of the protocol. So yes, we absolutely need to see those protections delivered upon. It's also the case that these protections, the protections in the, in the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, were agreed by the British government less than a year ago. I think it's important for people to reflect upon what that what it would mean for the reputation of the United Kingdom government when a minister stands up at the dispatch box and says the UK is going to breach international law. Now, there are some people here who have long-standing uh, reasons to perhaps to distrust what's said at the dispatch box in the House of Commons. There are, other, there are others who, who don't. I don't think anyone here should take lightly the idea that a British government is uh, gleefully walking away from its, um, its uh, obligations under in international law. And even if it is a stunt, a negotiating tactic to escalate tensions, we in this part of the world should be deeply, deeply angry at being used um, to escalate tensions in a negotiation between the UK and the EU. The UK government has, throughout this process, since these institutions returned and, and, and before these institutions returned, called for the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly to have its say. Well, we came back and we had our say in June. They didn't listen. We asked for an extension to the transition period. I don't know how any right-thinking person in the context of a pandemic wouldn't want the transition period extended. I, I reiterate that call today, but we haven't heard a single acknowledgement of it from the British government. Let's hope today if we pass this motion and a further private member's motion we're bringing tomorrow on the internal market bill, that finally the Westminster government will listen. Close. We need the protocol delivered, not because it's an ideal situation, but because it's a base level of protection. And I would urge members opposite to think hard about the kind of society they want to live in and how we move our economy forward in a way that serves everyone in our society. I call Steve Egan. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And of course, I'm rising to say that the Ulster Unionist Party will not be supporting this one sided motion. Um, it should come as no surprise to members of this Assembly that neither Boris Johnson nor indeed the European Union seem to have the interests of the people of Northern Ireland at heart. Is anybody who would be keeping a close eye on the negotiations that are going on currently between the United Kingdom and the European Union? One would wonder when the numerous pronouncements we hear about putting the people of Northern Ireland and putting the Belfast Agreement to its fore, that some of them would actually bother reading the document. And some of them would might actually consider the implications for the whole of Northern Ireland, but the whole of these islands for putting a border down the middle of the Irish Sea. One of the things from my previous roles when I was the Chief Executive of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce I was fully cognizant of the importance of the one billion euro slash pounds, there's not a lot of difference in it today, of trade that went back and forth across the Irish Sea every single week. This trade, north, south and east, west, is a circular trade. So by very, the very implication of putting a border down the Irish Sea, which many people seem to profess to do so, without realising the implications on trade for everybody and businesses across these islands, I think it's something that has to be considered. No, not just at the moment. I'll give you in a moment, please. But the key question we have to have as members of this Assembly is what does it mean to the people of Northern Ireland when we look at issues particularly to do in the future with state aid rules, with the role of the European Court of Justice, how this assembly is going to be able to legislate for issues that apply directly for the people of Northern Ireland, whilst at the same time as dealing with the considerable number of issues that are going to be brought about by the north-south and east-west borders that are going to be built. The really significant issue that we have to deal with is that time is running out. Come the 1st of January, we could be in a position where, despite what Simon Coveney would say, we could be in a position where food 
coming from the rest of our nation is deemed to be unacceptable. And we have heard from Michel Barnier and also from Simon Coveney that this is a ridiculous statement. But yet, when given the opportunity in the Specialist Committee or the Joint Committee to actually say that this will not be the case, guess what? They have said nothing. So for the people of Northern Ireland, for our electorate, and for the consumers that we all are, we need to get some degree of clarity about what is going on. That should be the issue in front of this House. That should be the issue for all of us. That is the question we should be asking. And we should be asking both Boris Johnson, and I am no friend of Boris Johnson's, and I do believe there are lots of questions that need to be asked about this House by some political parties decided on the 3rd of October last year that tariff boundaries down the, tariff and regulation boundaries down the middle of the Irish Sea were a good idea. But the reality facing us is what's going to happen on the 1st of January. And that is something that we, as an Assembly, should be concentrating on, not looking at motions like this that don't really ask specific questions. And I must admit, I, am, <laughs> I find it really surprising that the, minister, or the member for FOIL mentions the issue of fertilisers and why there were checks and fertilisers going back and forth across the border. I think if anybody was even remotely aware of what the circumstances were, of course there had to be checks on fertiliser, because most of it wasn't being used for the appropriate purpose it was put to. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker and members of this House, we have a motion in front of us that I don't think anybody would believe is balanced. We need to be asking questions both of the United Kingdom government, but also of the European Union. We should all be asking those questions together. We should be doing them in such a manner that raises the appropriate issues for the people of Northern Ireland, i.e. what's going to happen to us on the 1st of January next year. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I call Stuart Dixon. Um, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I rise to support this motion. Um, even in the turbulent issue of Brexit that overhangs our future, the protocol, which was agreed less than a year ago and is now international law, is, and I think members have heard that around the chamber this morning, an imperfect solution to the border issue for Northern Ireland. But it is a response to the potential barriers that a hard Brexit could construct. As a basic structure to protect the institutions which maintain our economic, political and social lives, it does have merit. It is an insurance policy. Although clearly the original backstop, negotiated by a previous Prime Minister, was a better deal for Northern Ireland, with fewer barriers incorporating the whole of the United Kingdom in the single customs market. However, nothing is ever settled when it comes to Brexit or this Prime Minister. No, you're fine, thanks. Sorry, apologies. I, I just was in a different zone. I will give way. Thank you. I'm really very grateful to the member for giving way. I, I, I wonder, just in his point about the Theresa May's backstop, uh, as a point I didn't get to make, would he acknowledge that the reason Theresa May's backstop, which would have largely avoided a border in the Irish Sea, a large part of the reason why it didn't pass was due to the kind interventions of uh, the party opposite, the Democratic Unionist Party, who refused to support it. And so, in many ways, they are the creators of the border in the Irish Sea they now rail against. The members, an extra minute. Thank you. Apologies again. Uh, I, yes, of course, I wholeheartedly agree. The, 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 the amateur dramatics of the DUP uh, in terms of the last parliament uh, are, are, are clear for all to see. Nothing is ever settled when it comes to Brexit or this Prime Minister. We now have an internal market bill which basically empowers the government to override elements of an international treaty signed only months ago. This must be of profound concern not only to members of Parliament who have been invited to and have participated in votes which break the law, but it has shamed the United Kingdom Government around the world. Let us be clear about that. The United Kingdom Government has been shamed by its Prime Minister and by its Cabinet. It is hard to discern what this Government is doing or trying to achieve. Even if this is just a simple negotiating tactic, it undermines the United Kingdom's international reputation and the ability to strike further trade deals. Indeed, it has apparently lauded a trade deal with Japan. Not a word of it different 
from what had already exists between Japan and the European Union. The United Kingdom was admired as a member of the uh, European Union for its influence, often uh, by the smaller member states who the United Kingdom was often a reasoned voice for. What sort of future will the United Kingdom have if it cannot and will not keep its word? Who would you deal with? Is this the global Britain that we want to be part of? One of the key prizes of Brexit is supposed to be the US trade deal. Mr Given and others have made reference to it. But it's not just representatives of the uh, House um, uh, in America. It is both Democratic and Republican senators who have made it clear that they are concerned and disturbed by its effect, uh, effect on the Good Friday Agreement and the harm that it would cause. There is also a clear risk to British-Irish relations, which have, and must be acknowledged, have reached a high point over the last number of years. The cooperation and mutual respect between the United Kingdom and Ireland has been a key building block of the peace process and in building trust between both parts of this island. A general election was won on the deal, which included the protocol, but now we're told we have to default on it. No deal would be a good outcome. What a massive failure of politics it would be if we have no deal. An indication of a government that doesn't know what it's doing and a blatant act of self-harm by a Prime Minister who doesn't care, exactly at a time when we need someone who is competent. Brexit also brings friction. We need to mitigate this and protect the Good Friday Agreement. The United Kingdom seems determined to isolate itself to self-isolate itself from the world's biggest trading blocks and deny Northern Ireland the safety net and the withdrawal agreement included. Locally, we need our ministers to get on with their jobs, implement the elements of the protocol. I really fear that the time is running out for not only Northern Ireland and its ministers to get the job done, but we are going to be in the business of further destroying livelihoods and businesses. Business needs certainty. It needs rules and a future where trade barriers are low and not increasing. Mr Speaker, in closing, the protocol is not perfect, but the apparent alternative is much worse. We need to get on with implementing it. It is within the United Kingdom government's power to reach a deal with the EU that ensures the goods and services can flow and trade freely through these islands. We should be building bridges, not borders. Mr Speaker. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the key line for me in this motion, which of course we will be vote, uh, voting against, refers to whatever the circumstances. Now, I think that in itself nails the real motive for this motion. Whatever the circumstances, no matter how bad it is for Northern Ireland, no matter what effect it has on the businesses or the, the constituents that we represent, whatever the circumstances, we must support the protocol. That's a completely no, I won't. That's a completely unacceptable position for anybody to be taking. But it's of course no surprise that Sinn Féin would take that position, because that's of course the position that they take on a United Ireland. Whatever the circumstances, doesn't matter if communities are divided. It doesn't matter if our businesses will be decimated. Whatever the circumstances, we should support it. Again, that's an unacceptable position. It's something that I uh, raised with the EU ambassador when he came to Londonderry on Friday. I made the point that not one single unionist uh, party, uh, or, or unionist for that matter, within this country supports uh, that protocol. It's disastrous for the United Kingdom, and it's disastrous for business, and it's important that, that they hear that message. Of course, and my colleague touched on this, for some parties within this chamber, the priority for them is ensuring that connections with Dublin are retained, connections with the EU are retained, but again, whatever the circumstances, they want us to support the protocol. Our own MP in Foyle, Colum Eastwood, and other MPs were tripping over themselves to get onto the airwaves to, to, to I suppose, uh, support the position taken by some of the US politicians around the US-UK trade deal. A constituency like mine in Foyle, which is devastated uh, not only by the COVID pandemic, but years of of issues and, and lack of infrastructure and investment. Yet you have a position where political parties are actively encouraging no trade deal. 
with the US UK. You know, it's a crazy position to take. And we'd ask members to reflect on that. But again, those members who will go through the lobby today are making it clear, whatever the circumstances, we want to support the protocol. I would ask members just to reflect on that. In terms of issues itself with the protocol, our party has been clear uh, that, that we do not support it. Uh, at every opportunity, our ministers, our MPs and our MLAs have actively, ca actively campaigned to address uh, some of the flaws uh, within that, uh, and there are many. There are key concerns around the protocol, and it's been touched on, and again, it was something that was raised with the EU ambassador. The tariffs, the GB to NA trade uh, tariffs, the, 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 the risk there, and the fact that the EU was using Northern Ireland as leverage and risking a food blockade on Northern Ireland. The paperwork, the regulatory checks, issues for fisheries, VAT, state aid, all of these issues are very much uh, a concern to our local, our local businesses. Much has been made as well, Mr Deputy Speaker, of the Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Agreement. The Belfast Agreement contains one substantive, sub, substantive mention about the, RO, uh, the Republic of Ireland border, and that relates to the, demilitar to the demilitarization which has already happened. I don't know of anyone who is calling for the army to rebuild those installations on the border. The Belfast Agreement, however, was about respecting... Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just want to know if the member would be aware, of course, that one of the people from the United States who has been calling indeed for these arrangements, uh, sort of uh, Representative Peter King, uh, not only was he responsible and said that he would support the breaking of the NAFTA free trade agreement, but also wants walls and reinforcement of the border with Mexico and indeed I understand Canada as well. How could this possibly be the case being quoted as an example? The member's an extra minute. Well, I, and I thank the, the member for his intervention. And this points out the hypocrisy. And I would take all of those comments with a pinch of salt because all of those individuals who have uh, come out and commented, uh, there's question marks over the motives with that as well. But what I would say is to those who are, again, supporting this motion, whatever the circumstances, they need to explain to our communities, our business communities and our citizens, how making it easier for business to trade with its biggest market within the United Kingdom is a breach of the Belfast Agreement. They need to explain that. Yeah, go ahead. But, uh, far from anyone talking about there being extra measures put on the border, the then Prime Minister of the Irish Republic, uh, current Deputy Prime Minister of the Irish Republic, said that he could deploy his army on the border with the frontier with North Ireland. But, you know, crazy position. I, I, do, I, I do agree with the member, and he's absolutely right. But what I would say is that, just in, in, in closing, those members who are going through the chamber today, I would urge them to listen to the business community, listen, listen to, to the. Well, well they laugh. They, 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 they laugh, but they, 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 the, 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 those, people, those people that are laughing, they're, they're, they're actually laughing at the business community who have been. Order. Decimated. De de decimated uh, through the current uh, pandemic, but also with the, the potential borders going up uh, in the Irish Sea. Uh, those are the people that are going to have to be uh, answerable to. And I would urge members just to reflect that whatever the circumstances, are close. they should be not be supporting this motion. Thank you, Ms. I call Melissa McHugh. I've got last from Carla. Um, I'd have to say at the outset just that if self-interest requires a U-turn, then Boris Johnson is capable of that. Something we all know, but in particular uh, the people on the other benches, they know that only too well. How many times has he U-turned on them? And yet and all, like the uh, obedient lapdog, he still like his toes and wait for the crumbs of his table. Can I say from the outset that the EU withdrawal agreement protocol was a compromise and built within that compromise is an arbitration system to allow the parties to sign to deal with any disputes that may arise over certain issues. And I think that many people here have touched on that, but yet haven't uh, explained that there is that arbitration system there 
that in the event of there being disputes in particular products or the likes of it, it could have been worked out between the parties uh, signed up to the agreement. But by introducing his internal market bill, Johnson is totally undermining the protocol. The protocol not only defines, defends the interests of the people of the six counties, but also the Good Friday Agreement. And it has been stoutly defended by member states of the EU and more significantly by the United States of America, guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement. Let's not kid ourselves. The, inter the internal market bill is about Boris Johnson and England and what is best for them. If truth were told, it's about fisheries to a lesser degree, but more significantly, it's about state aid, as already alluded to by the leader of the Unionist Party, uh, and the rules governing state aid to industry. It also gives to the Tory government the power to impose rules and regulations on this assembly which can undermine our agricultural industry, in particular by compelling the Assembly to accept lower environmental food safety and animal welfare standards. Boris Johnson, whom we all listened to recently, he hides behind the defence of the Good Friday Agreement. It wasn't mentioned by him at the time they signed up to the protocol, but the negotiators for the European Union always had the Good Friday Agreement uppermost in their sights and its defence as a central plank from day one. Johnson, he went on so far as to suggest, and some of the people here have nearly sort of touched on the same issue again too, he went so far as to suggest that we in the north of Ireland might even be starved by the European Union who would limit the import of food products to this island. I just thought it ironic that a representative of the same class and party overseeing the starvation of millions of our people in the 19th century whilst they exported food from Ireland. And now they tell us that the European Union are going to do the same because of limitations on the importation of foods to this island. How ironic. So I ask you, who do you trust? Michel Barnier, Chief Negotiator for the European Union? No. Ursula von der Leyen, Head of the European Union Commission, no. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker no. of the House of Representatives, Order. and many of our politicians from all parties here in the north of Ireland and throughout the Republic of Ireland as well. Who do you trust when it comes to defending our interests and our rights? Or Boris Johnson, who shows no respect for this agreement, no respect for international treaties, which incidentally, the Chief Justice, and you're all shouting, no, Declan Morgan had stated, international law is grounded in trust and confidence between nations. And when that's totally and absolutely ignored, it actually seeps down and there's a corruption even within our own domestic law as well. Johnson is incapable of identifying with an age-old proverb of Nafena, the rare Mabriher, according to my word or translated more directly into English, a cornerstone of the business community in itself, my word is my bond. We must be seen to oppose this departure in every way through the bill suggested by Would the Johnson. Draws remarks it's a closed? departure from basic law and the respect for law within nations and between nations. And we must be much more principled in every respect how it is that we deal with our affairs. I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, like many in this chamber, I was shocked and appalled when the Northern Ireland Secretary admitted that the internal market bill broke international law. For me, it showed that the current Tory government could not care less about the Good Friday Agreement, nor the people of Northern Ireland. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and thank you very much indeed for the member to give her way. I, I think uh, when we're talking about breaching of international law, I think the most disappointing thing about the United Kingdom government breaching international law or planning to is to take them down to the same level as the European Union and also exactly the same level as the United States. So I think the United Kingdom has a much higher standard to adhere to. 
Um, I don't know if I can agree with everything that you said there, but I will tell you this. I'm not a lawbreaker, and I wouldn't like to think you were either, some of the posts that you held before. Mr Speaker, I've spoken many times on the need to protect the oil island economy, both north, south and east-west. I have used these examples before, but the impact of a hard border on this island will have such a profound economic impact that I have to use every ounce of my breath highlighting the issue until someone somewhere listens. Our whisky industry is entirely integrated, with County Antrim producing single malt for the entire island and bottling whiskies for distillers in the Republic. In my constituency, Coca-Cola, which has already been mentioned earlier, bottles produce syrup in the Republic of Ireland, which comes from County Mayo up to Lisburn. The products are then made within Lisburn and packaged and distributed throughout the whole of Ireland of Ireland. That is a unique business arrangement which that company has just for this island. These are just two large examples. There are countless numbers of small to medium-sized enterprises who rely on products, services and buyers from across this island who have no idea what is to come at the end of the year. The impact is not just felt by current businesses. It is also preventing new businesses from opening. There is a unique craft whisky industry that is booming on the island, and it's becoming one of the most significant times for this product. Many distillers have opened in the north, but the uncertainty of Brexit has severely impacted on their money and their trade. For the UK Government to tear up previous international agreements on a whim only adds to this uncertainty, and I am hearing every day of more and more businesses giving up on the place that I call home and I love, and that's Northern Ireland, and that to me is fundamentally wrong. If we don't fight now, this situation will become terminal. Let's be clear, it is our people who will suffer from the protectionism and the policies of this Tory government. I don't know if any of you get the opportunity to watch some of the events from Culture Night that was online at the weekend. Participants highlighted the strong artistic and cultural traditions across this island, from Derry to Cork. John Hume understood this cultural connection. Martin McGuinness understood this cultural connection, and the Reverend Ian Paisley understood this cultural connection. The Tory government will never understand it. They will never understand the all-island makeup of our economy, of our health and our energy sectors. They don't even understand where the border is. In the face of Tory ignorance, it is on the use to protect that failure of our citizens. I urge you all to support this motion. I call Philip McGuigan. Gary Melgut, uh, last can call you. And I welcome the motion brought forward by my colleagues, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on the subject, on a, a subject that is of vital importance to my constituents in North Antrim. It's of vital importance to many businesses, big and small, across the North, and of vital importance to the all island economy and the hard fought and hard won uh, gains of the Good Friday Agreement, and vitally important to peace and stability on this island. There is no good Brexit for the people of Ireland, and that is why the majority of people in the North voted against it. Nobody wanted then, or wants now, barriers to trade or movement of goods, or indeed the movement of, of people. And that's why Sinn Féin didn't support Brexit. And all of the potential uh, issues that are being discussed today, even some that are being discussed by the DUP and the Ulster Unionist Party, are uh, issues that are elevating or common emanating from Brexit. Uh, and I hear the members on the other side talking about the consequences of Brexit, a Brexit that they supported. It is Brexit that is the problem. The Irish Protocol is designed to mitigate against the worst impacts of Brexit on citizens, businesses and communities here in the North. It should not need to point it out but the protocol was an agreement reached between the EU and the British government, the current British government, in fact. And yet last week, we have the internal market bill brought forward by that same British government to thwart an agreement and the commitments that it made. Am I surprised that a British government would make a deal, sign an agreement, and then try to undo it or circumvent it in a way that breaks international law? 
to suit its own narrow political interests? Am I surprised that the British government would display little or in some cases no knowledge of the impact that their decisions could have on the people of this island? Am I surprised that their actions, even when they are aware of the implications and the impacts, are made clear to them and they have little, they have little care about the impact their decisions will have on the people on the island of Ireland? even when we are talking about something as important as the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process. You won't be surprised to know that I am not surprised by anything done by this particular British Government. It is important, though, that this Assembly, representative of the people and interests of the North, has its voice heard and registered. The Internal Market Bill and its implications on the Irish Protocol is totally unacceptable and, indeed, very dangerous. There can be no damage to the Good Friday Agreement, no hardening of the border on the island of Ireland, and we in Ireland cannot be collateral damage to a British Tory Brexit. If Brexit is to proceed, then the Irish Protocol must be implemented. I sit on the Assembly uh, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, and on a weekly basis we are discussing the potential negative impacts of Brexit and indeed the uncertainty for our business community. 25,000 frontline farming families in the north will be affected. Obviously, a large percentage of the north export does go uh, east, but a far greater number of businesses, mainly small and medium enterprises, export largely or solely to the south. 50 per cent more businesses here sell to the south than export to Britain. The vast majority of this trade carried out, as I have said, by small uh, SMEs, uh, the backbone of our economy. 80 per cent of micro businesses and 70 per cent of small businesses solely export to the south. The agri-food sector, which uh, is, is huge in terms of its importance to the northern economy, is no different. While east-west trading is undeniably hugely important, the very production of the products we export is inextricably integrated north and south. Annually, over 400,000 pigs are exported from the south to the north for processing. The same number of lambs are exported north-south. Over 800 million litres of milk are exported to the north to be processed and then export it from the south. East-west trade, as I have said, is vital, but in order for us to even produce the products that are exported east, north-south trade must be seamless. In the ERA committee, we are told that 200 lorries a day come across the water to stock our shelves. Whilst that is obviously vital, anywhere from 6,000 to 12,000 heavy and light good vehicles cross the border every day. In our committee del deliberations, we also share the concerns of those in the environmental sector about the impact on current EU legislation and environmental protection. Regardless of political allegiances, we are an island nation with our own unique environment. Living on an island, it would be completely, utterly ridiculous for us to have different environmental standards and practices north and south. Birds and fish, rivers and hedgerows, the very air we breathe, are not bound the by borders. The EU has some of the highest environmental standards in the world, and without risking binding standards of the same or higher levels, we risk a risk race to the bottom for environmental standards and protections. I call John Stewart. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise today um, to support my party colleague, um, Steve Egan, who has already spoken on the motion, to say that we will not be supporting the motion as worded here today. Um, I am pro-business and I am pro-union, and I suppose it was for two, those two fundamental reasons that I did not support Brexit. And um, We firmly believe that they would not only potentially impact the union, but would have massive consequences on business trade. Um, when the result came as Democrats, we accepted that. But it's barriers that are the biggest restriction to trade. And the protocol puts in place very difficult circumstances and abilities for businesses to trade uh, east-west. It has been referred to in the motion about um, the trade north-south. And obviously, that is important. There's no doubt on the island of the whole island economy. But fundamentally, the biggest market that Northern Ireland has is east-west and with its relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom. And any impediments to that would be deeply regrettable and deeply impacting on the businesses here we have. I know one business in my constituency recommend, uh, reckons that it would cost up to £1 million per year to implement some of the uh, measures and red tape and bureaucracy that would be required just to have the protocol in place. And that will be deeply damaging. I don't want to see any barriers in place, but what we don't want to do is see that paperwork is introduced so that um, companies are unable to do the business that goes across 
every day. Um, my party colleague referred to that £1 billion pounds worth of trade each week. Any impediments on that would be deeply damaging to our economy, and it is regrettable then that that is not referred to anywhere in the motion. Um, what I also fear is that we will see more and more on adverts and TV and in products that are sold online and elsewhere not available in Northern Ireland because so many companies, both in um, the United Kingdom and here, will, will not be able to want to either do the paperwork or pay the additional costs that will be, re be required to, um, to bring those products in, um, further diminishing Northern Ireland and, and having that economic impact. So, like I say, it is regrettable that that is not within the wording of the motion. Um, we also referred to um, the impacts on potential for state aid and the impact of the ECJ as well in terms of um, any additional legislative burden that would have here, have here and on um, our, biz our ability for businesses to trade. It's also referred to in the motion about the, um, protecting the Good Friday Agreement in, in, all its, um, in all its forms and see nothing diminished within that. I do find it somewhat ironic, given that it was just a couple of months ago that the Sinn Féin MP from Mid Ulster referred to the um, Good Friday Agreement and said that nationals have been sold a pub. So I'm trying to figure out whether they actually support the Good Friday Agreement or whether it is, as, as, as the MP Francis Lloyd said, a pub that had been sold to the nationalist community. My party. Um, supported the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts. And we, uh, I'm sort of pressed for time, or so briefly. Okay. <laughs> the subject of being sold a pup, would he not also agree with me that the Prime Minister sold the nation a pup whenever it came to protocol and winning his election? The members, an extra minute. Indeed. Thank you for that intervention. I would say the Ulster Unionist Party supported the Good Friday Agreement for, throughout, throughout, and um, when I spoke to my party colleague Red Jempe about this recently, he, he, he highlighted the point on Sinn Féin's role within the Good Friday Agreement and said that they did not participate in any of the negotiations on Strand 1 issues, in fact didn't even endorse it at the end. So it does feel somewhat like the protection of the Good Friday Agreement and all of its entities is something that Sinn Féin have found quite lately, or conveniently, as in the relationship with the European Union, which is again a marriage of convenience quite recently. I'll acknowledge the fact that there are some parties in here who have been dedicated and, through, and supported the European Union throughout, and, and refer to the SDLP in that, who were consistent in their message, and I'll, and I'll give them credit for that. But this continuous support and um, idolisation of the European Union in all its forms from Sinn Féin it does seem to have come quite late um, to, to the party in that respect. Um, but from a unionist point of view, I mean, the Good Friday Agreement is clear. The present wish of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland, freely exercised and legitimate, is to maintain the union and accordingly that Northern Ireland's status as part of the United Kingdom reflects and relies upon that wish and that it would be wrong to make any change in the status of Northern Ireland save the consent of the majority of people in Northern Ireland. So quite how a border in the Irish Sea of any type is compatible with the Good Friday Agreement in that respect is quite frankly beyond me. Uh, the Belfast Agreement removed Articles 2 and 3 and enshrined the principle of consent, meaning the Northern Ireland people and they alone would decide their future. So surely any impediment to trade in either direction, north, south, which identified in the motion, but east, west, is a clear breach of the Good Friday Agreement. How can there be an argument against that? It cannot simply be a claim that barriers between the Northern Ireland Republic, the Northern Ireland and the Republic is a breach of the Good Friday Agreement, but any restriction on trade barriers going east or west is not. Because the two, the two can't be mutually exclusive. So I, I just, it doesn't seem to, to, to stack up to me in that respect. If we look again at the economic impacts, Northern Ireland's biggest market is with the United Kingdom, and any impediments on that would be deeply damaging to our trade here. So what I would say, to finish, I think the focus should be on getting to the 1st of January and constructively together trying to carve out something that we could find as a workable solution so that we can protect our businesses here. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Members, question time is due to commence at 2 p.m. I suggest that the House takes its ease until then, and this debate will con continue after question time when the next speaker scheduled uh, to make a contribution will be Andrew Muir. So take your ease, members. Okay, members, um, we will now return to the debate on honouring the EU withdrawal agreement protocol. And the next person listed to speak is Andrew Muir. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Normalisation is the process by which ideas, actions, behaviours, or events that society previously considered extreme and undesirable come to be accepted as within the bounds of acceptability. Normalisation can be the force for good but we also we must be wary of it. 
In recent years, at both at the local and international level, we have continued to challenge, have had to continue to challenge normalisation. It is not normal or acceptable to go out their government for three years. It is not normal or acceptable for the President of the United States of America to feel racism or continually lie on social media. And today, we must recognise the absurdity of what we are debating. We, as an assembly that was founded by an international treaty, are compelled to ask, no, uh, we are compelled to ask our sovereign government, the same sovereign government that signed the aforementioned Good Friday Agreement, to respect international law by not unilaterally breaking another international treaty. I should not have to ask my government to obey the law, nor should anyone else. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am not here today as an enthusiastic supporter of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Unlike members of other parties, I have actively campaigned against, before, uh, against Brexit before the referendum and afterwards for decisions that would have not have been made necessary. But it is necessary, and the threat of the UK Government to unilaterally walk away is utterly reckless. Brexit, which my party has always said would be a disaster for Northern Ireland, makes necessary regulatory and customs checks. Unicorn fantasy solutions do not solve the problem. They just take us full circle back to the reality that a Brexit is bad for Northern Ireland but cannot and can't be implemented without any friction. We are in a fine mess, signed, sealed and delivered by the DUP who cheerleaded Brexit in 2016. Acknowledging that checks may be necessary and they must be undertaken in the Irish Sea, the Northern Ireland Protocol was the agreed mechanism for managing these checks, hailed less than a year ago as a negotiating success by the Prime Minister as an oven-ready deal. Yes. Thank the member for giving way. But would he recognise, and I, I, I note what he said about signs sealed and delivered by the DUP, but the very protocol that he talks about, would he not put on record here today and acknowledge that the DUP on three occasions not only voted against but were vocal in their opposition towards the Northern Ireland Protocol. The member's next minute added. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The reality was that during the, de the debate around Brexit in 2016, the Alliance Party and others made it very clear about the implications of Brexit and were now living with them. These were Northern Ireland voted against Brexit for the very clear knowledge of the implications of that. Walking away from the Northern Ireland Protocol as the UK Government has threatened to do so, risks serious implications and sets a dangerous precedent. As Margaret Thatcher once said, Britain does not renounce treaties. Indeed, to do so would damage our integrity as well as international relations. How the Conservative Party has changed since then. To threaten to collapse the Northern Ireland Protocol and necessitate a hard border in Ireland in order to avoid exit declarations while at the same time destroying the international reputation of the UK is a bizarre way to try and support businesses in Northern Ireland. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have worked for decades to create a society in this place where you cannot pick and choose the laws which you are going to abide by. We are currently asking people to abide by laws and regulations that create a tremendous strain on their lives. We must not normalise the approach of the UK Government, and I am happy to condemn it as utterly unacceptable. My party calls for the UK Government to honour its commitments to an international treaty. It is indeed a worrying state of affairs that we have to do so. I support the motion. Aram, sir, just McNulty, hon can I call just McNulty to speak. The Ireland Protocol contains vital protections for the North and for the whole island of Ireland. The Protocol is no one's first choice for our island, but it is a necessary response and compromise that has been forced by the hard Brexit ideology of the right-wing ideologues in Downing Street. The Internal Market Bill is a blatant, irresponsible instrument that seeks to override the Ireland Protocol. It recklessly threatens the Good Friday Agreement in substance and in spirit. Okay. Thank the member for giving way. And he, he quotes and mentions the Belfast Good Friday Ag Agreement, as many have. And this motion says about uh, protecting the Good Friday Agreement in all its dimensions. But would he not recognise that the most fundamental core? 
basis of the Belfast Agreement is the principle of consent, meaning that it is for the people of Northern Ireland to decide their constitutional future and as such remain a full and integral member of the United Kingdom. How does the protocol protect that? Members, next a minute at it. Um, I don't believe your party consented to the Good Friday Agreement. Um, yes, of course. Would the member agree that Northern Ireland did not consent to Brexit and the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain? Thank the member. I, I don't believe your party consented to the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, I do believe your party did consent to Brexit, which is what's, uh, the source and the root of all the problems here. Um, this island did not consent to Brexit. This part of this island did not consent to, this, to Brexit. Right now, businesses want to see the protocol implemented in a way that works. Right now, businesses want maximum access to both the UK and the EU markets. Right now, cross-border workers or frontier workers want to know they will not be impacted. There are still unanswered questions. Right now, businesses want and need clear and unambiguous information on where they stand and what the future holds so that they can plan and prepare. Okay. Way. Businesses have actually welcomed the Internal Market Bill because it is trying to address some of the problems that they have with the protocol. So will the parties not get on the side of the business and minimise the damage now, rather than going back to this ideological debate all the time? Thank the member for his comments. Not, not the businesses I know. Um, right now, businesses and communities know that the way to achieve a compromise is that for the UK has to abide by its original obligations and work constructively to implement the Ireland Protocol. Very simple. I support the motion as tabled. And I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I rise to support the motion. And I think the willingness of the UK Government to unilaterally move to change the EU Withdrawal Agreement Protocol, a protocol that they painstakingly devised, agreed and signed off with, with the EU, a move our current Secretary of State unequivocally stated to the House of Commons last week would break international law, should be roundly rejected by all in this House. The EU and the UK Government agreed this protocol as the best way to secure peace in Northern Ireland. It cannot and should not be allowed to be changed unilaterally. The narrative from some that this move is needed as a safety net or the irony, a backstop, should, not only go, should also not go unchallenged. It has not been the EU negotiators that have been consistently threatening a no-deal Brexit. That has always been the threat from the UK government. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson has openly stated that I do believe that I can get a no-deal Brexit through the Commons. I think that MPs on both sides of the House also understand that they will face moral retribution from the electorate unless we get, it, unless we get on and do it. No such threats have come from the EU negotiators. They have consistently repeated that Brexit is bad for us all. The majority in this House also agreed that there is no good Brexit for Northern Ireland. And while the protocol is imperfect, it guarantees that whatever the circumstances, there will be no hard border on this island. It will protect the Good Friday Agreement and further ensures that trade from Northern Ireland to GB remains unobstructed and protects our place in the internal market. The central ask from most businesses here at home. So when talking about the Withdrawal Act, the Prime Minister has told us many times that we've got a deal that's oven ready. We've just got to put it in a gas mark, gas mark four and give it 20 minutes and Bob's your uncle. In the Conservative Party manifesto, Boris Johnson himself wrote, with a new parliament and a sensible majority government, we can get this deal through in days. Hmm. Good luck. But while we have all listened to his lies and his spin for years, this latest move to brazenly break international law should be taken as a new level of duplicitous governance and the Green Party will not be on record as supporting it. No, you've had plenty, thanks. Many others will also not be seen to be complicit on this either. Many resignations have already happened from people with more integrity and self-respect than this Tory government. For example, Jonathan Jones, 
the Treasury Solicitor and Permanent Secretary at the government's own legal department, is the sixth senior Whitehall official to resign this year amid growing tensions between the Prime Minister and staff at the top of the civil service. His departure <clears throat> follows the exit of Cabinet Secretary Mark Sedwell, also Jonathan MacDonald from the Foreign Office, Philip Ruttman from the Home Office, Richard Heaton from the Ministry of Justice and Jonathan Slater from the Department of Education. If Brexit was simply about economics, it would have been sorted long ago. Trade deals today go way beyond negotiations on tariffs on goods, whether they move north or south, east or west, because either way, Northern Ireland is not set to benefit. Trade deals affect how we regulate big business and foreign investment, how much we charge for our medicines, the standards of the foods we eat and the environment that we create. In short, trade deals shape what sort of society we will live in. And as for this move from the UK government, it is setting us up in the eyes of the world as a rogue state. And that is not something any of us should be supporting. Northern Ireland continues to live in a fragile peace process. We should reject any and all attempts to undermine our peace agreements. And for that reason, the Green Party will support this motion. I call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The key question for everyone who is supporting this motion is not whether or not they can get over their ideology and get over 2016, but whether they really care about the people of Northern Ireland. Because in supporting the protocol, they are supporting that which will crucify business in Northern Ireland. They are supporting the imposition of exit declarations on everything that passes from Northern Ireland to GB. They are supporting tariffs on everything that passes from GB to Northern Ireland. And let's just pause and remember what the balance is. £11 billion pounds a year of goods from GB to Northern Ireland. £2 billion from the Republic of Ireland to Northern Ireland. And yet the proponents of this motion, Sinn Féin, SDLP and their lackeys in the Alliance Party, they want to strangle business in Northern Ireland. They want to make life difficult. They want, in fact, to submit Northern Ireland to hundreds of laws over which we have no say, about which we cannot even debate. They want to submit it to a foreign court over which we have no input. That is the essence of what those who are peddling this motion are supporting. And of course, they cloak it quite disingenuously in support for the Belfast Agreement. Well, let's just take that. I have the Belfast Agreement here. I'd just like to ask all these proponents of the Belfast Agreement, belatedly Sinn Féin, of course, didn't support it initially, the SDOP, who are always very upfront in support, Alliance Party likewise. Can any of them point me to a single paragraph in this document which says the United Kingdom or the Republic of Ireland couldn't leave the EU? Can anyone point me to a single paragraph in this document that says there couldn't be regulations between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland? I'm waiting. I'm waiting for, well, very well, Mr. O'Toole, give me the paragraph now. I'm not looking for hyperbola. I'm looking for facts. I'm looking for the cold data. Give me chapter and verse in that which you proclaim, which says you cannot have regulations between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for, to the member for giving way. He would look at. Uh, can I invite him to look at Strand Two of the uh, of the Good Friday Agreement? Can he further find in that among the list of, uh, I believe, a dozen north-south implementation areas? One of them actually includes EU bodies, actually includes EU spending. So the idea that European Union membership is irrelevant to the Good Friday Agreement is is irrelevant. And further to his point, can he say to me if uh, some form of regulatory uh, bar or regulatory threshold between the islands? 
of Great Britain uh, and the island of Ireland, GB and NI, is unacceptable. Was it then, was it is it unacceptable to him to have the current all island phytosanitary sanitary area that we have at the minute? The member has it. Next minute. And verse. Which clause, which paragraph says you can't have regulations between Northern Ireland and the Republic? Which clause says you can't have a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic? Which clause says you must trash Article 6 of the Act of Union? None of them. Not a single one. And yet the proponents uh, tell us, oh, you have to protect the precious Belfast Agreement when it doesn't say a word about any of these things. That is the most disingenuous spin that there has been in the whole Remain debate, to dress up and pretend to the ridiculous point where you have presidential candidates repeating the same lies, where you have a member of this House, Mr McHugh, telling us the American government is a guarantor of this agreement. None of that is here. But what is here is a supposed recognition of the integrity of Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom. And yet, everything about this protocol, everything, is in the business of destroying that integrity. And that, of course, is why Sinn Féin are its enthusiasts. But if we want, you know, when I talk about the hypocrisy of all this, it's brought home very strongly to me when I hear the mover of this motion, a convicted bomber, talk about the rule of law. Talk about things being unconscionable. Talk about human rights. A bomber. Talking about that which is unconscionable? Really? Talking about human rights? Really? That is the hypocrisy that reeks from the mover of this motion, who, of course, is one of the most avid demanders that the Belfast Agreement in all its parts. But she sat silent when I challenged her. Which part of the Belfast Agreement does the protocol, does uh, this proposal uh, uphold? Not a single one. And therefore, I say to this Would House, the member bring his remarks I say to, to this House, House, please. rightly reject this motion. I guess next year, I'm sorry, Jerry Carroll, on your couch. Uh, Jerry, you have four minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, the latest move by Boris Johnson will surprise no one. The Tories and the privileged elites who support them don't care how it will impact on, on people here. And all along, the Tories have ignored what people think, how they voted during the referendum, and ultimately the reality of lives for people who live on a divided island, especially those living in border towns and communities. Just because it may not be a surprise, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, doesn't make it any less repugnant. Um, that the Tories would be willing to throw people under a bus in such a callous way. The latest internal market bill might be a tactical ploy by the Etonian to get a better deal uh, from the EU in negotiations, but who could really rule out the Tories, who are once again willing to disregard people here in a bid to essentially get a deal which suits British capitalism? Johnson and the Tories put billionaire bosses first from the coronavirus pandemic to Brexit. What this latest saga has given verve to is the need for people here to govern for themselves and not be repeatedly dictated to by London, be that through the issue of Brexit or indeed the coronavirus pandemic. Far too often, Mr Deputy Speaker, through the pandemic, executive parties here have followed suit and danced to the tune of an out-of-touch Conservative government. Johnson and the Tories have demonstrated over and over again that they aren't worried that their standoff with the EU could lead to the return of a hard border in Ireland. And this latest move uh, once again threatens the possibility of a hard border. The people of Ireland, both in the north and the south, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, have made it clear to Westminster and Brussels and to the Doyle and Stormont that they do not want and will not tolerate the return of a hard border. Under no circumstances will a hard border be allowed to return. So this latest uh, shenanigan no doubt, Mr Deputy Speaker, add momentum to the call for a border poll, a united Ireland and a, the ending of the 100-year disaster that has been partitioned. This renewed argument for democratic self-determination is not just unique to the North. We have seen emerged conversations around national governance in Scotland, Catalonia, the Basque Country, Quebec and many other places. And both Westminster and the EU have set their face against these democratic movements. But the vision of a new Ireland, a socialist Ireland, uh, rejecting the neoliberal 
neoliberalism of elites in Westminster and Brussels is gaining momentum. And the protocol, the Northern Ireland Protocol, even as the motion does suggest, is definitely far from perfect and does have fundamental flaws within it. However, it is clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Internal Markets Bill is an intent by Boris Johnson to bolster the strengths and fundamentally the profits of British corporations whilst risking a no-deal crash out of the European Union and the beginning of a war over tariffs. The way the British state has rolled out their limited testing and contact tracing programmes give an indication how Messrs Cummings and Johnson view the state in modern society. The Tories have poured £10 billion of public money in the likes of Circle and other private corporations uh, to run England's test and trace programme, and it has been an absolute disaster. While only £300 million of additional funding has been offered to local authorities to support the test and trace programme. And who do they put in charge to run such an important system? Not a health expert, but a loyal Tory baroness, a former chief executive of Talk Talk. Something you'd probably expect to see in an episode of The Thick of It, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, but this is government policy in the middle of a health pandemic. And despite the Tories criticising the left over their view uh, of, the, of a state that intervenes in the economy and protects um, people's lives, the Tories essentially want to do the same. They want to intervene in the economy in a way that will increase the wealth and the power of major corporations that are based in Britain. That's a complete and utter disgrace. And that's why, uh, Cummings, close, please. I will do. that's why Cummings and Johnson are looking towards the state to intervene in such a way to bolster uh, their mate. Their mates. So, uh, this latest internal markets bill would result in an effective power grab and massively elevate the powers of the Secretary of State, whilst riding roughshod over devolved I have to ask the member to conclude. Please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I guess next year, I'm sorry, and Dr. Kiva Archibald, on Kriyaka Correlation Mall, I would call uh, Dr. Kiva Archibald to. Um, a fortnight ago, we stood here amidst the speculation of what the internal market bill would contain, and despite what Mr Given asserted, we were all very exercised about seeing the details. It is fair to say, upon publication, it was worse than feared, and showed the British Government are in fact intent on tearing up the protocol in the withdrawal agreement and the very necessary protections contained within it, protections painstakingly negotiated, agreed to and ratified by that very same British Government. And while no surprise to most of us in this island, the blatancy of the extent to which it has reneged on its commitments to the point of admitting the intent to break international law has been met with outrage and condemnation, not just from the European Union or the United States, but from the, amongst the ranks of its own diplomacy, Tory MPs and former British Prime Ministers. Can I get through a bit and I will come back? The intent to disregard an agreement which they committed to an international treaty less than 12 months ago, has shown the British government to be incapable of living up to its commitments. It is, of course, worth reminding ourselves, as the motion outlines and as others have referred to, people here did not consent to Brexit. The protocol as negotiated is an imperfect compromise, as referred to by several members, Mr O'Toole, Mr Dixon, Mr McHugh and Mr Muir. But it goes some way to mitigating what are the only negative outworkings of Brexit. It was negotiated to protect our economy, North-South cooperation and, of course, the Good Friday Agreement. The nonsense claims that this bill is designed to protect the Good Friday Agreement are perverse and have rightly been met with disbelief and ridicule. The bill, as my colleague Martina Anderson outlined, undermines all three strands of the agreement. It curtails the powers of the Assembly and the Executive, with the Scottish and Welsh administrations also criticising it as a power grab. Would the member tell us which paragraph of the Belfast Agreement does it infringe? And could I also ask her, she obviously has never read Section 38 of the Withdrawal Agreement Act of 2020, or she would have known that the agreement was passed subject to the sovereignty of Parliament. Thank the member for his intervention. Um, and yes, I have read the Good Friday Agreement. I'm quite uh, over it and the details of it. Uh, moving on, thank you. Well, members, please not make comments from a sedentary position and interrupt other speakers. Obviously, following the publication of the bill, we also had renewed reports in the British press about the intent of Boris Johnson to roll back protections of the ECHR, also referred to by Martina Anderson. The protocol, Article 2, commits to no diminution of rights, which includes the ECHR and Good Friday Agreement rights contained in the annex of the protocol. 
When the British government threatens to override parts of the protocol, it causes alarm bells to ring about what else they would attempt to undermine and reinforces the necessity of the withdrawal agreement and protocol being fully implemented to protect our economy, communities and peace agreements. As to the member, very grateful, and I'll be brief for to give, giving way. Just in relation to some of the claims that have been made about um, implementation of the protocol and blockades and things like this, is it, I'm sure the member is aware that Article 16 of the protocol, as it stands, has a standing safeguard for where there are uh, any societal or economic disruptions, including the kinds of things people are claiming. So, in a sense, the, what the claims Boris Johnson is making about the bill, those, the powers to safeguard against those things already exist in the protocol. Um, the, the claims that are being made are quite ludicrous. As other or contributors have mentioned, the international community, not just in the EU, is looking on on this. I'm sorry, I, I'm running out of time. And you have to wonder why on earth would any country looking on and with whom the British government might want to do a deal in the future believe it worth making an agreement with? And with that, I'll pick up on some of the points that other contributors have made. Because Mr Gibbon lamented the fettering of trade by the protocol it never fails to bemuse me that Brexiteers willfully ignore the link between their campaigning for Brexit and the problems which have now resulted. As Mr McGuigan said, it's Brexit that is the problem, and as Claire Bailey highlighted, the protocol is there to protect all of that. And let's deal with other issues of trade, because the DUP and UUP members have today and often talk about the importance of the British market. And I concur, as many other members in supporting this motion today have as well, it's a vitally important market. We want to see as little friction as possible in terms of trade. Most recent figures for 2016, total exports to the South, to the EU and the rest of the world now exceed sales to Britain. When it comes to goods, which of course is what the protocol refers to in terms of unfettered access, 6.5 billion in sales to Britain, 8.7 billion to the South, the EU and the rest of the world. And when we look at the rest of the world, seals were 3.5 billion. The top five countries for, account for the majority of that. Number one is the United States, worth as much as the four, next four countries combined. And let's be clear for the members opposite. The only people threatening the free trade agreement with the United States are those who are trying to wriggle out of their commitments and in the process override the protections of the protocol. The next biggest country, Canada, no free trade agreement with it yet. Thailand, same. Australia, same. China, the same. The Economy Minister in her role has consistently said her top priority is to seek to ensure that Northern Ireland firms have unfettered access to the internal market in the United Kingdom. The Economy Minister has also indicated she was advising executive colleagues that she is not willing to bring forward an LCM on the trade bill because she does not have the necessary reassurances that the North is able to be a full participant in future UK trade deals. What has she done about seeking new reassurances excuse me, <clears throat> that we can have access to existing EU free trade agreements through the protocol? Has she lobbied for that? Because that is a very significant issue also. Putting all our eggs in one basket and focusing on unfettered access to the detriment of other trade agreements amounts to negligence. No. <clears throat> Matthew Tool highlighted the important issue of divergence in services and what sometimes gets lost in the discussion with the focus on trade and goods. It is one of the imperfections of the protocol and where energies need to be focused in trying to minimise those divergences as well. Steve Aiken said the EU does not care about the North. It cared enough to make it a priority in the negotiations. It cared enough to insist issues with the North were resolved as part of the withdrawal agreement exactly because of the wrangling that we are now seeing. Sorry. He and his colleagues also mentioned state aid. And the irony, of course, is we have Brexiteers and unionists talking about state aid as if by leaving the EU they will be shaking off the shackles that has restricted them using it, when in Britain it is in fact amongst the bottom five countries in terms of spend and state aid as a percentage of GDP. Germany, Denmark, Hungary all spend four times as much as Britain does. It is, of course, how state aid is used that is the issue, and of course those countries they will be seeking to do free trade agreements with, like Japan, will be looking for commitments around state aid also. A number of members, Martina Anderson, Pat Catney, Philip McGuigan, all referred to the integrated nature of our supply chains, a fact that can't be ignored when we talk about the importance of the British market. We need to recognise this, and in seeking to ensure unfettered access to the British market, which, as Claire Bailey pointed out, is included in the protocol. 
there can be no compromising on the protections, because the protocol is not just about trade, it is vitally about rights and protections of communities and our peace process. By taking the path that they have, the British Government and Tory Ministers have shown once again their complete disregard for our peace, our economy and businesses, jobs and livelihoods of people on this island. What our, what our businesses and communities more broadly have been crying out for is certainty, and this bill has done the exact opposite of creating certainty. The negotiations which are ongoing require all parties to contribute in good faith. There are difficult issues to resolve, issues that Mr Alistair referred to, like exit declarations and tariffs. Those are part of the negotiations, and that's without even considering important issues not included in the protocol, mutual recognition of professional qualifications, access to EU funding schemes. We cannot sit back and allow our businesses, economy and hard-won peace to be collateral damage. We will continue to work in partnership with all those who are willing, here in the Assembly and Executive, in Dublin, Brussels and across the EU, to protect the best interests of citizens in the island, on this, excuse me, <clears throat> across this island. The withdrawal agreement is an international agreement. It needs to be maintained and upheld in order to protect our economy and our peace agreements. I urge members to support the motion. Uh, thank you. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. 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 I think we have division. So uh, clear the lobbies. Uh, the question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come to the chamber. Thank you. Order. Uh, could I ask that members resume their seat, please? Um, before I put the question, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. However, the question is that the motion, the things I have to read, uh, the things I have to read. Uh, however, the question is that the motion on the order paper standing uh, in the name of Dr. Archibald, Mr. McAleer, Mr. McHugh, and Ms. Anderson be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. No. Okay. No. Okay. Do we have tellers? Okay, members. Um, tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the ayes are Kiva Archibald and Martina Anderson. Tellers for the noes are Gary Middleton and Steve Aiken. Uh, before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that, as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I also remind you to ensure that social distancing continues to be observed while the division is taking place. Please be patient at all times and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. Uh, we now clear the lobbies. The Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order. Uh, I would ask members to resume their seats, please. Um, Clerk, would you read the result, please? Simple majority division result. 84 members voted, 48 members voted aye, 36 members voted no. The motion is carried. That's it. The motion is carried. Unfasten the doors, please. <laughs>